Welcome back to the Mina Kimes Show featuring Lenny, the only NFL podcast or one of the hostings everyone should play inside and outside. That's Lenny. I'm Mina Kimes. And I am so happy for what I hope is now a Mina Kimes Show tradition, which is that it is Combine Week. Uh, and I'm so thrilled to be joined by my friend. Uh, he's a draft analyst for the Locked On Network. He has a podcast there called Renner Ranks. Uh, Mike Renner, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me back. I must have done something right last year to get another invite here. You you did. And and my invitation to you, I said, you got to take a victory lap. Um, so I had you on last year and I asked you for names to watch ahead of the combine. And, and, and I want to be clear, it wasn't like the best guys necessarily. You, weren't, you didn't come on to say these are going to be the best players or, or whatnot, just names you found intriguing. Um, one of those names... Uh, got me to the finals in my dynasty league where unfortunately I lost to Nate Tice. Uh, but Keaton Mitchell was the mid season pickup for me. Probably I would say, so you came on, I went back and looked and, and there are a lot of names that I think were sort of outside the obvious ones that went on to be impactful during the NFL season. Uh, Kalijah can um, he ended up being taken in the first round, but when we talked about him, he wasn't very well known, was injured at first, but then super, I thought, um, impactful for Tampa Bay. Um, ended up, actually, I, I looked this up, had four sacks and 26 tackles, 10 TFLs in 14 games. Nick Herbig made some plays, including arguably knocking my Seattle Seahawks out of uh, playoff contention. Even Dewan Jones, who you b- brought up in that podcast Ended up starting for the Browns when Conklin went down, and then when he went, when he got injured at the end of the year, it was a big deal. But I would say Keaton Mitchell, of all of the names you brought last year out of East Carolina University, was the true gem of last year's pod. <laughs> I'm not sure I have any gems on this year's pod. Last year was an interesting class in that there were so many either very undersized or very oversized yeah. guys to discuss, and so I thought that was super interesting going in to the combine this year to me, there's just a lot of like high end athletes. So, I, so yeah. on my list to you, I was, I sent over, I was just thinking about the guys and I'm like, I'm just going to send over a bunch of guys who I think are just freaky in one way, shape or form to discuss, because I do think that this year's class has a bunch of intriguing names going into this year's combine. We're going to get go over some of those names. There's names on offense. They're on defense. It's a good pod to listen to if you want to sound smart and say, my team should take a look at this guy, or just names that you should pay attention to how they perform at the Combine. Um, but before we do that, uh, the other aspect of the Combine, other than testing these prospects and doing the interviews and the medicals and all of that and the things that matter, is um, NFL news tends to come out of it because uh, GMs, coaches, some coaches, some are not, some are there, many are there. And um, there's a lot of, this is obviously a very significant time in the NFL season, what with players being tagged or not tagged, trade rumors ahead of the draft. Um, there's a couple of stories sort of right now that I don't want to talk to you, discuss with you before we get to the combine names. Uh, and the first one I want to talk about, it's not really a story in that there's no concrete news yet, but um, the Minnesota Vikings, uh, two things happened at the Combine in Indy. Um, their GM, Questi Adolfo Mensa, said uh, there's they're definitely not trading Justin Jefferson, which isn't surprising, but is something that's been speculated about. And then um, their head coach, Kevin O'Connell, uh, and again, this is not news, but he said, you know, we think Kirk wants to come back here. We want Kirk Cousins to come back here. I, I, I find that interesting, Mike. I mean, it, it's long been seen as likely that he would return. However, when you take a step back and you look at all of the teams that need quarterbacks, you consider the fact that the salary cap is taking a massive leap this year. And you also consider the fact that Kirk Cousins is an absolute mercenary at the bank. Um, It wasn't a foregone conclusion. It's not a foregone conclusion because there's teams, there's a lot of teams, I think that he's the most desirable quarterback option. Do you think it makes sense for him to go back to Minnesota? Do you think it makes sense for Minnesota to pay him? I think it does. I think it makes sense for both angles on this. And now maybe my former PFF colleague, Eric Eager, would disagree. He's one of the biggest Kirk Cousins haters out there in terms of like the contracts that he ends up signing and can you actually win with him? Mm -hmm. But I look at last year and when he was in, you know, arguably one of the better situations of his career in terms of like offensive line play, in terms of what he had at wide receiver. And the fact that you're going to have that now, assuming 
you know, you don't trade Justin Jefferson. You're going to have that with him, Jordan Addison, those two offensive tackles for the rest of Kirk Cousins' career there. You know, he's 35 years old. I think he's at a distinctly different point in his career than when he was that mercenary getting tagged, looking for the biggest dollar every single year. I think now he's looking for the best situation for him. And last year he was playing close to an MVP level. I know like the MVP, uh, it was a down year for quarterback play, but he was right up there with the best Mm. in the NFL. So he's already made $231 million now in his career. Is he going to haggle over five to 10 million here between what maybe the Vikings would offer him and someone else on the free agent market? Maybe, but I think that given the offense that they have there, given the talent they have there, if he went to Pittsburgh, if he went to Atlanta, there's just too many unknowns for him and the rest of his career that, you know, if he signs like a three-year deal, he may get another swing of the bat with uh, someone else after that's over if he stays in Minnesota. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, Before Kirk Cousins was hurt last year, he had the highest QBR he's ever had with the Vikings, and he's been there for quite some time now. He had the lowest off-target percentage in the NFL, and he wasn't checking it down. He was about average in, in terms of depth of target. And he was second in the league in completion percentage over expected. I think by the end of the year behind just Dak Prescott. He was extremely good last season. And and hand up, I was critical of Kirk earlier in his career. I viewed him as a win with quarterback. I felt like he was a play action merchant. But I also sort of felt my views on him changing, not just last year, but it was about halfway through the previous season where it felt like he was more willing to push it down the field, take tri- risks, throw it up to Justin Jefferson, always a good idea. Um, and I do think he is a quarterback that you can go far with. Uh, I also think to your point, like as decent as the other scenarios are, and Atlanta's decent, Pittsburgh's decent, Minnesota's still better. Uh, this is a defense that played better than they had any right to last year. And I have to think um, if they do keep Kirk Cousins and Justin Jefferson can spend their pick 11 or trade down, that might actually be an interesting trade down spot, by the way, because if they're picking right before Denver for that second tier of quarterbacks. But in any case, it's a good team. I think it makes sense. And I think, you know, like they could get sort of a, I don't know, Daniel Jones style contract done, you know, where it's like two or three years 40, low 40s. I, I would do it if I was him. I don't know. Yeah, like at this point, it's like, why would you maximize your money and have to move your entire family and play for a crappier team? I would stay in Minnesota if I was him. I agree. And from the Minnesota side, I think they're even more desperate. Like everyone's, mm. I think they've realized, you know, after he went down, how good they oh, had yeah. it there, <laughs> you yes. know, and how yes. it may not be as easy to find one as they might think, or as people might have suggested the past few years under Kirk right. Cousins. So uh, you could hit reset, but you're close enough to win games now, I think. And if Kirk Cousins is healthy, you're a playoff team next season. Okay. So I think uh, more disputable and a little trickier is the next story I wanted to bring up with you, which is T Higgins being tagged in Cincinnati. You're in Cincinnati, right? So I was about to say your hometown. I used to be. Okay, I lived there seven okay. years. All right. Okay. I don't know what the right answer is here. Um, I, let's, let me start this. I, I think it made sense for them to tag T Higgins. Uh, I think that was always going to happen. So just to kind of lay things out, The Cincinnati Bengals are going to pay Jamar Chase when they do so is a question, um, but they're going to do it. That's not a, not a, not a, not a question. The question is whether or not you sign T Higgins to an extension, which would put them in pretty unprecedented territory in terms of paying two uh, wide receivers and your quarterback, a lot of money uh, to tag T Higgins, which they did and just have him play this year. Kind of like what happened with Jesse Bates in Cincinnati and just say, we're still all in. We got Joe Burrow. This offense is great with these wide receivers let it ride or tag him and trade him. Uh, So that's where I think this gets a little tricky because um, I sometimes think we like on the outside place too much emphasis on the future. When we talk about teams that should be Super Bowl contenders in the present. And in that sense, it makes sense to me say, you know, why not just our offense is like a top five unit with these receivers. Let's just continue to ball out. And next year is next year. However, um, I don't know if that's smart from a team building perspective. Uh, I guess the cop out answer is to say, well, let's see what teams offer for T Higgins. Uh, You know, and then the comp of course is um, 
it's not a comp because the player's not a comp, but Kansas City is is a similar situation where they t- they traded Tyreek Hill. They got a lot for him. The they got first and a second from Miami, and it's just late late round picks. They turned those picks into what was a Super Bowl caliber defense. So all that said, if you're Cincinnati, do you just ride this out or are you open to trade offers? Yeah, to me, this does feel like similar to when Miami tra- uh, tagged Jarvis Landry, where it's just like mm. we almost are trying to buy the year of the compensatory picks that we knew we would get should he walk. Um, because I don't – like they've been reporting out of Cincinnati ever since last offseason that he really wasn't in their long-term plans. And also I think they're uniquely situated that in this wide receiver class, pick 18 – to kind of just get his replacement right away. Like it, it is such a deep yeah. wide receiver class, so talented, which also may hurt his trade value. Unfortunately, I don't think you're getting, Good point. you know, when Amari Cooper got traded on his fifth year option, he was, he got a first round back, back from Dallas. I don't think that's going to be the case for T Higgins. I don't think anyone's offering a first in this wide receiver class, but I think you can easily get a second, which would be more than you'd get from the compensatory pick. So I think that's the route they take because, I think the Bengals just know this roster is about to get real expensive on them yeah. with that Jamar Chase deal and just have to be a little more forward thinking with how they have to allocate that money. The other thing about the Bengals compared to the Chiefs is the defense is bad. They were bad last year, like real bad. Um, there's litany of reasons for that. It was, it, it's a defense that was in transition, lost a ton of players after the Super Bowl season, obviously very well coached. Um, and there were some injuries and whatnot, but they, they, they while I, I think to your point, like this is obviously an awesome draft to take a young wide receiver and kind of like their Jordan Addison, right? Sort of, um, they also really need to continue addressing the defense, uh, and which is what Kansas City did. So, yeah, it, it feels like you know, I, there's that famous quote from Joe Burrow, like, my whole career is my window, they need to think that way as well. Um, and I do feel like if you can get a second, you have to be pretty open to it, um, knowing that you're not going to pay him. No, he, I mean, he's going to demand a pretty sizable contract. That'll be an interesting one, though, again, given I keep waiting for the wide receiver market to kind of drop out because of what's been happening in the draft and because of how amazing this draft is. I suspect that top tier is going to like, you know, you're obviously Justin Jefferson's, for example, are still going to get paid. I think my que- what I'm going to be curious about is that sort of second, those like 1B, 2A type wide receivers, if teams want to give them gigantic contracts, knowing that they can get similar production in the draft. I, I just pulled up the, the 10 top 10 receivers in yards per route run from last year, Mike. Eight were on rookie contracts. Oof. Yeah. <laughs> well, as long as they're the Panthers, though, I think someone's going to be out there desperate, right? That's true. <laughs> as long as there's yes. teams that have just like no wide receivers, yes. they're going to be desperate. Panthers are the team that I, I think I, <laughs> we did like a uh, fixing the bad teams pod, and I just said, go get T. Higgins for them because, yeah. yeah, they certainly need to do something. Uh, the final story is that there's going to be an extremely robust free agent market for running backs, not so much for wide receivers, but there are a zillion running backs that are not being tagged. This was reported yesterday by Adam Schefter. Um, I mean, just the names Saquon, although uh, their their front office said today, maybe, but I, I kind of doubt it. Uh, Josh Jacobs, Tony Pollard, Derrick Henry, Austin Eckler, DeAndre Swift, AJ Dillon, Devin Singletary, Zach Moss, J.K. Dobbins, Gus Edwards, Ezekiel Elliott, Clyde Edwards-Hilaire. That is insane. Um so I haven't really dug into the running backs in the draft and spoil none of the names you sent me were running backs, but doesn't seem like a very um, strong draft for backs. Am I correct? That's being kind. Yeah, you're not missing much by not having watched them, to be fair. And, and okay. that could be why this is a robust market for these free agents. It's because mm-hmm. I'm taking all these guys before the top running back, even in a week running back class or – even though, you know, the age is obviously a factor, there's really no, I don't see like a game changer out there in this class. If yeah. you know, it were me, I wouldn't take one until day three in this class. Now, some will obviously go before that, but it wouldn't even surprise me if we don't even see one until the third round, which would be, it's been a while before anything like that's happened. The Seahawks so, don't have a second round pick, so we can't do exactly, it this year. Exactly, that might be why. <laughs> well, also no more Pete Carroll, yeah. unfortunately. So um, the team, the, the, all the head coaches that would draft one, Arthur Smith, Pete Carroll, I don't know. Did you see Belichick. Dave Canales saying today, I'm going to be stubborn about running the ball. I was like, oh, God. Yeah. Don't. Pick 33. 
No. Oh, uh, the legacy. <laughs> oh, God. But I, I do think the interesting thing to me, though, is that for all those backs that are kind of hitting free agency, I feel like there's, or at least the bigger names, whether it's Henry, Jacobs, and Barkley especially, I feel like they're division rivals that could use all of those yeah. guys. So for Henry, I feel like the Texans is an awesome spot for him, basically mm. replacing, being like just an upgrade over what Devin Singletary did there because he's one of the best zone runners, you know, Tennessee over the course of the years. Right. Been that, Bobby Slowick, that's what they do down there. Um, Josh Jacobs to the Chargers feels like, now I don't they don't have great cap space, but he just feels like a, a Jim Harbaugh running back to yeah. me and just how he runs. And then Saquon to the Eagles. Like if the market's not there this year for him, he might take a prove it one year. And if you go to the Eagles, you're going to, your market's going to be hotter the next year, just because that offensive line compared to what he ran behind the giants is going to be night and day. So that that's the intriguing storyline to me in this running back mm. sort of free agent class is that there's kind of needs in all these division rivals for these guys. You broke the Cardinal role of uh, appearing on an ESPN podcast, which you didn't mention the Cowboys. Uh, who, no. Which of these backs are going to end up on the Cowboys? Someone's uh, got to. I don't see. I don't know if there's none of them like stuck out to me as great fits for the Cowboys. Just yeah, offhand. I'm looking at the list, yeah. And McCarthy just over the course of his career, at least like when he was with Green Bay, is what I'm thinking. That was never really in his plans. He likes to pass the ball. He mm. likes drop back passing game. So I don't know if he goes out and spends big money on a running back. That would be, yeah, that, that'll be interesting. It could, right. It could, I, I mean, I think one of the names I mentioned is going to be Cowboy. I don't really, I, I, I'm with you. I think there are better spots for the bigger names. I was surprised. I was um, looking at some of the advanced metrics for these guys over the last year just to see uh, who really went off of a cliff or who performed better than expected. And I was actually surprised Saquon was better than I would have thought from watching. Um, you know, I was, I like to look at the rushing yard over expect expectation, the next gen stat mm -hmm. stat that isolates running or tries to isolate rushing production from uh, blocking. And uh, he was like 11th, which was pretty impressive, obviously in a pretty dismal situation in New York this season. Um, I'm really interested in seeing who ends up with the chargers for a couple of reasons, one of which is Greg Roman is now uh, yeah. with the Chargers. Uh, and the other is I, I, watching J.J. McCarthy over the last few days. Um, I just kept getting distracted by how cool Michigan's run game was and uh, how diverse and interesting it is and sort of modern. Uh, so I've, I have to think that the combination of Roman and Harbaugh will bring a lot of that creativity on the ground to LA. You know, I think I saw kind of nerd Twitter get a little freaked out by the Greg Roman hire and, and Roman talking about the need for a run game, but that doesn't mean, you know, they're going to run the ball stubbornly like can Alice put, it just means they want to run the ball better, which God knows the bar there is pretty low based on the last couple <laughs> of seasons. So that, that, that to me is a really interesting destination for a back. Um, but yeah, I'll be curious. This is going to be a really, really interesting offseason for that position. All right. That's enough of the news. Uh, I want to start with the offense, and I want to start with the wide receivers you sent me, who I feel like you purposely picked two of the most opposite players possible. Uh, let's start with Ladd. <laughs> uh, at some point, I'm going to be able to say Ladd McConkey without laughing. Um <laughs> Let's start with this. Can you come up with a cross-racial comp for Lad McConkey that I can use at the Combine? I have been saying this for a while now, and okay. it's lofty. I get that it's lofty, but he oh, this I is who he reminds me of just from a movement skill standpoint. Okay. And it's Antonio Brown, the <laughs> former Steelers wide receiver. <laughs> From an on-field perspective also. We're not going <laughs> off the field. But they're almost identical from a size perspective. Antonio Brown was actually a little bit shorter. Same wingspan, same weight. Mm. And just the ability that I see, the thing that really stands out and why I mentioned him in particular is that they both can go from full speed to complete stop just quicker than almost mm -hmm. any wide receivers that I've seen at collegiate NFL level. Like that's And that's a skill that wins. And that's how Antonio Brown – Got open deep despite running, he ran like a four, five, six at the combine. He, he was never mm. a blazer, but he could vary his speeds and really threaten corners because 
he could stop at will. And so you're hip to hip with him. He'd just stop and make you blow by him at any given point in time. And so he was nasty on the outside. And that's what I see with McConkie is just that ability that, oh, you're with me right now. But as soon as I want to, I can yeah. stop, run a dig, change directions, run a comeback. And you can't stick with that. And so I, I watched him down at the senior bowl, just be uncoverable in one-on-ones. And you watch him in the SEC, you know, some of the best corners. I think Daniel Jeremiah tweeted this out. He said, all these SEC corners look good until they face Vlad McConkie. And it's like, that's, uh, you know, that's just the kind of athlete he is. So everyone's wanting to move him to slot. I don't think so. I think he is an outside really? wide receiver okay. uh, through and through that can play slot if need be. But I, I, I watch this guy's tape and I see uh, just a polished router. Maybe a lower end comp for like that sort of player. Tyler Lockett is probably not as lofty, but that's kind of – Tyler Lockett's been an outside wide receiver his end of, uh, pretty that's much true. his entire NFL career. So I think that's kind of the type that you're looking at. Yeah, I think while I was watching him, I was thinking like it um – if you and I were having this conversation 10 years ago, I would have said slot only, but I feel like um, there's so many Z receivers around the league now where coaches or offensive coordinators have just gotten so good at getting them free releases and getting them open and finding creative ways to get, because look, you, I, I, not many examples of this, this, this young man beating uh, press, but um, it often doesn't matter because his movement skills are crazy. Uh, it is impossible to talk about him without using the word jitterbug uh, over and over, but he is the kind of player for whom that uh, word was invented. Uh, he has this like crazy low center of gravity when you watch him. I, I, I don't. It's kind of hard to explain, but he just doesn't. He he's got like really really elite balance. Um, and and to that end, I, I'm really interested in seeing some of the stuff at the combine because I feel like. I guess there's two things. There's I, I I would like to know how long his arms are, uh, and I also think he could go crazy in three cone and some of those drills. They were not long. I think it got measured <laughs> in senior bowl. I think they were just over oh, thirty okay. inches. But his wingspan is yeah. five eleven. His wingspan was six foot, which usually most guys you get about three to four more inches on top of your height for mm -hmm. your wingspan. And so not his skill set, but. I mean, he makes plays outside his frame really easily. And what I love watching his tape or just watching him actually go through drills at the senior bowl was he would, you know, a lot of guys, when they get to the sideline, you know, dragging their toes, being able to like feel where they are, aren't as natural to them. He was just catching balls. And all of a sudden that the two feet would be dragging. You didn't even like realize it by his gate. He wouldn't even have to change it up. He just had that part to his game. And that's, you know, another reason why I go to Antonio Browns because he was the king at that. He absolutely yeah. could know where he was body on the football control. field at all times. Just had that elite body control. Yeah. Lock it as well. I think it's, it's pretty comparable. Yeah. Um, it's like his catch radius. I, I wrote like, it's almost like the low half of it is amazing. <laughs> um, <laughs> he, he, <laughs> just don't throw it high. Just don't make him yeah, go jump ball. He does something that drives me crazy with uh, smaller receivers is he jumps when he doesn't have to sometimes. And I really, that's like a personal pet peeve of mine. Um, but he has good hands, you know, and it's just, that's just not his game, but he's such going to be such a weapon at the goal line, regardless on like pivot routes. And um, I, I it's so easy for me to imagine him being productive in the NFL. Uh, what price in terms of draft pick you pay for that productivity? I don't know. Like where, I mean, do you have a sense of where he is being projected or, cause it feels like, again, it's kind of like one of those things where like for the right team, I feel like he's really, really valuable. I think second round is where I imagine he comes off the board. I would I wouldn't go, I mean, if I'm pretty high in him. So if I'm at the back of the first or even top of the second, I've said the Panthers at 33, if he's on the board and you've already seen like five, six wide receivers off the board, he's just such a high floor that just give him to Bryce Young, you know, just like, just let him have a guy that you know is going to be good at wide receiver instead of taking all these chances. So that's, that's kind of where the starting point for him is. And then I don't think he makes it to the third. Though. That you, you giving him to the Panthers is like when in high school, there's like a girl group and a guy group of friends and they just make the short people think because <laughs> they're shorter <laughs> than everyone. Uh, it would be very cute. Uh, yeah. He, I, I, I kind of want him with a good team though, to be honest, like as the wide receiver three, you know what I mean? Like I, I just, yeah. uh, 
But I hear you. Uh, okay, well, that's a good transition to the, like I said, the, the, uh, the aforementioned opposite player. Um, Johnny Wilson at FSU, six foot six? Is, did he measure in six foot six? Six seven. He ventured in, actually. Okay, because I was just about to say, I just wrote, I, I wrote down, I cannot think of many historical examples of NFL receivers with this build and body type. And I'm sure you've thought about that. So let's start there. What is the precedent for this gigantic man? The precedent for him is Darren Waller. Darren Waller was 6'6", 238 coming out of Georgia Tech. Johnny Wilson, 6'7", 237. This guy is, I think it was what did Booger say that one time, he's a biscuit away from being a tight end. Like he is. Like this is a guy who needs to move to tight end. If someone, if I'm a forward thinking okay. team, I'm saying That's your gonna be my earning second potential question. Yes. is so much higher at tight end and you just get so much of a more... Uh, favorable route tree, uh, shall we say, in terms of what he's asked to do. Because if he's just putting him on the outside, ask him to win one-on-one against corners, it, it's too easy for those guys to get their hands on him, disrupt his timing, is limited in what scope he could do. But if you're asking him to run the route tree of a tight end, which mm. is a lot of drags, a lot of seams, over the middle of the field stuff, with his catch radius, with how much, I mean, he has over 35-inch arms, truly one of the biggest catch radiuses, or radii, excuse me, that you'll ever see. <laughs> from a pass catcher that's something you want work in the middle of the field so yeah. if i'm his agent i'm telling him hit the weight room or if i'm the coach that drafts him I'm telling him hit the weight room this off season maybe you're not a tight end day one for us but you're two you're three i mean there's a tried and true method to guys like jimmy graham mm-hmm. guys like darren waller who maybe aren't 250 right away because they weren't trained their whole life to be tight ends but that you're still a young guy you can still add muscle i think he can get there and then when that's the case i mean the athletic traits are so much better than your run of the mill second, third round tight end, wherever he may come off the board that it's just, Hmm. that's what wins at the position. Yeah. Uh, I was wrestling, watching him. I was wrestling with the question of like, is he struggling to get separation or does he just have the craziest longest arms I've ever seen? (laughs) And you know, sometimes when you're like, ah, is this, are, are, are you just like a contested catch? Um, are you amazing at this or are you not separating enough? Um, and I think it was like a little bit of both, to be honest, at times. I mean, the arms are, he it, it, it really looks like go-go gadget. Like they're so long and he has really great hands and it, it is unbelievable to watch him just uh, pluck a ball like yards away, it feels like, because of his wingspan and his length. And I like how he uses his body. A lot of his production uh, at FSU was on in-breaking stuff, and he's really good at using that big frame to um, sort of shield himself from DBs. To your point, I can definitely imagine all of these skills translating into the tight end position, Uh, but he would have to get a lot stronger, um, which I don't know how hard that is. I don't, you know, you talked a little bit about some of the precedent for, I don't know how difficult um, that would be, but the, I, I mean, it's just very unusual player. I, I mean, I, I just, it, there's so little precedent for me. Yeah. And it, it's just, I don't think there's ever, it's just, I, I guess go back to like what his ceiling could be at wide receiver. He's never going to get open consistently enough against corners. You know, I, even when he does, and he's actually not terrible at, kind of, you know, getting that, that first initial separation, but he just doesn't have the juice to keep separate. Like corners make up that ground quickly on him. Whereas if it's a linebacker, they're not going to, you know, they just don't have the athletes at that position like it is at corner. So once he does, so he can create that initial separation and then keep getting away from linebackers. And then I don't think it's too much to ask. Like if he were just at his size right now, if you're just putting his receiving skills against say the tight ends that are in the NFL I mean, he'd be a top 10 just in terms of like his ability to get open compared to those guys. And so now it's just, can he be respected as an inline blocker? Probably 10 to 15 pounds away from that, but 10, 15 pounds over three years, two or three years of a rookie contract, I I think is imminently doable. Well, the Waller mention, I'm not going to call it a comp per se, but uh, it really, like it feels right when you watch him when he has the ball in his hands. You, You talked about getting away. That's what really jumped out to me is how smooth uh, he looked um, after the catch. And, you know, you talked about, again, like with Waller, 
think about him on some of those drags pulling away from linebackers. It's so easy to imagine this guy um, producing in a similar fashion once the ball is in his hands. I think that, you know, it's just a question I think about, okay, well, how do you align him to get to that point? I don't know, but I, he's, I imagine you're, you don't expect him to go in the first two rounds, do you, or? Probably not at this point, but I do think third round is where I, I imagine he comes off the board just because skill set. Yeah. 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 I'm excited to just see him walking around <laughs> here, uh, standing with the other wide receivers like that video, my favorite video of, of the guy in the cornfield running around chasing the kids. I feel like that's what it's going to look like. I want him next to Lad McConkey for a photo. <laughs> he looked like a basketball player, right? I mean, that's what he looked like yeah. in person out in Senior Bowl. I can't believe just watching it because I had only thought about Keon Coleman. The F is used crazy. <laughs> like watching it's just like, oh my God. Um, yeah, unbelievable uh, duo there. Um, okay, so you, you sent me a couple offensive linemen, very interesting names. Um, so one of one one of them is the more kind of like the Dewan Jones project type. The other one is a guy I've found fascinating. I haven't um, sort of arrived at my own conclusions yet about him, but I, I have seen his name continuously just popping up in my feed. That's Amarius Mims um, out of Georgia. It feels like in recent weeks, uh, okay, let me start by saying, you know, I, I didn't hear him talked about as a first rounder for a while, maybe just me not paying enough attention. Now I feel like I'm seeing his name everywhere. Like he seems to be one of the fastest risers at the moment. So let's start there. Why do you think he could go in the first round? One, just because what you'll see at the combine, he's six, seven, he's three forty, and he'll probably test. He might run sub five seconds. Like he's going to test very well. He is just a high end athlete at that size and offensive tackle, maybe not the most traits driven position on an NFL football field, but it's definitely kind of like a, there are, you can identify the guys that have what it takes to succeed. There's good Lord only made so many guys with six foot, six, five, 300 plus pounds with 34 plus inch arms, right? It's just, it's such mm -hmm. a high threshold athletic trade position. And he not only hits all those thresholds, he's like at the very top of all those thresholds. And so great starting point. Right. Um, but then I watch his tape and for a guy who's barely played football, 803 career snaps was only started for the first time in the playoffs for Georgia back in 2022, um, those two games. And then this year is just starting right tackle for them, gets hurt, ankle injury, only plays a few hundred snaps. So not a lot of track record, but on them, I, I was floored at how much he didn't look like a project. You know, for a guy who's played very little football, he was very technically sound. I mean, it's kind of like Jackson Powers Johnson, who I didn't have on the list, this list, but he's a one-year starter at Oregon and he's like very polished. And he just came in, one-year starter, and he just looked like he knew what he was doing already. Not a guy who you think needs a ton of foot would need a ton of football if he would have just finished out the entire season. So very unprecedented. If he is a first rounder, I, I think the past decade, Ryan Ramchick's the only off to tackle who's played fewer than a thousand snaps in his career to go in the first round or offensive lineman in general to do mm -hmm. so. But you put all those things together and it's a guy that if he had come back and played a full healthy season of kind of what we saw on tape earlier this year and maybe even taking a little bit of a next step. And in a weaker tackle class, he's going like top five or 10. That, that's the kind of athlete we're dealing with. So to me, he's super intriguing in that not only could he you know, still go top 20 with that, but he could also like be good fairly early on just because he's, he's almost like an NBA lottery pick. We just, we just haven't seen enough. He's just yeah. you know, one of those true freshmen. We just haven't seen enough to really know what he's going to be. Well, I think in in contrast to the guy we're going to talk about in a second, what we have seen also came against top competition, so yes. it matters more. It's easier to project out. Um, quick B, because I talked about this with Field Yates with the wide receivers, but I guess you could ask the same question about the tackles. Like, could this be one of the best offensive tackle drafts in recent history? I think it breaks, actually, the record for most in the first round. So wow. that was, I believe, 2008 when Jake Long went number one overall and it was, it was either seven or eight. I, sh I should know this. I think it's seven. So seven OT is the record for most in the first round. I think at least eight could be up to 10, depending on how you want to 
classify some guys like like Troy Fatano from Washington, who maybe Team CS guard, or Graham Barton mm-hmm. from Duke, who could play tackle or guard. It could be up to ten, so it's a pretty nasty tackle class for sure. Do you, is it just a like coincidence, or I mean, because with receivers, I think you know over the recent years we all kind of understand the dynamics that have led to young receivers being so productive. It, like I, I feel like for the last five or six years, it's constantly oh, there's not enough tackles. Oh, every team needs a tackle. Suddenly, yes, a lot of teams need tackles, but it feels like there's like a, this weird surplus of them. It just is random. <laughs> I have no explanation. Yeah, I, I think there's easy explanations for wide receivers and maybe yeah. even quarterbacks getting drafted in the yeah. first round, like we'll see here this year. But OTs, I don't know. <laughs> They're just getting bigger, right? <laughs> maybe yeah. that's it. I, well, these guys are big. Giants. And the so the last guy you mentioned, I'm not going to lie and say I've seen a single uh, – down of this young man playing football, even though uh, he went to my alma mater, Yale. Um, he is Kieran Amagaje. Am I saying his name right? Um, I'm a, I'm I a think Gage? that's about right. Amagaje. Amagaje. Yeah, there we go. Um, so I've seen some people have posted reps of him on Twitter. That's all I've seen. Uh, my <laughs> analysis is he looks strong. <laughs> uh, so please give me m- your more detailed draft report and explain to me why a Yale offensive tackle is even being discussed. Yes, had to throw one from your alma mater on here when there is one because I'm not sure. I actually didn't look up before, but I can't remember the last Yale player to get drafted or even talk about or even like I think there was yeah, a Foye wasn't drafted, right? Yeah, he, um, I, or was he a seventh rounder? But maybe seventh round. Yeah. So this guy is, he's going to get drafted. He's going to be a top hundred pick too. He's not even, he's not even just like a fringe guy. This guy is high end traits. And again, what I'm talking about with OTs, it's just the NFL identifies the athletes that succeed there. And he has all those traits, 36 and three ace inch arms. You know, he's going to be uh, test off the charts. If it may not necessarily test off the charts because he did have a quad injury this past year, a torn quad, mm-hmm. which I've had a torn quad that took me about eight months to recover from, and I still have a hole in my quad. So it's not pleasant. So maybe he won't test as well as he maybe looked on tape. But on tape, you just see a guy who sticks out like a sore thumb against that competition. You know, he was just it looked just like a different, uh, different caliber of athlete altogether than what he was going against. You see nastiness that I know offensive line coaches are going to love. He does not just is not comfortable just you know getting the block done and then playing the next play. He he wants to finish those blocks into the turf. But man, is he a project? I mean, and it's almost in a good way in that there's really not much mm-hmm. technique to speak of. I'm watching him mm-hmm. in the running game, and his first steps, like a good portion of his of his like base blocks, are back is backwards. He's not even he's not even gaining ground right after the line of scrimmage, kind of like day one stuff. And it's just because the attention to detail in terms of they don't have these massive coaching staffs and, uh, you know, in the Ivy League that guys like Alabama do, guys like Georgia uh, coming out at OT. So there's good reason for him to still be a project. Um, mm-hmm. And his guy who didn't even play football until later on in his high school career because he was a basketball player. So there's a lot of reasons to point to that could think that yeah, he might not be a guy you're plugging in day one to start. It m- might not be in kind. He won't be. But there could be a quick developmental curve just based off of what I've seen from his coordination on tape and how just bare bones his technique is at this point. I wonder if teams that have really um, strong offensive line coaches like now, I don't like t- Tennessee just got um, Brian Bill Callahan. Uh, if they view that as like an opportunity to go after guys like this later in the draft, knowing that they can redshirt them essentially and teach them how to play the position. I don't, I'd have to, that wasn't uh, Cincinnati's approach now that I think about it. So maybe that's not true. But when you talk about a player like this, I do think like, okay, well a team where you don't need a tackle to play right away. Seems like a great opportunity there. Um, and there's a lot of precedent for, small school offensive linemen who have kind of gone that route and gone on to be pretty productive in the NFL. So yeah, I'll be curious to see jo- I mean, well, Dewan Jones is very different obviously, but when we were talking about him, I don't think on the podcast last year, you, you, I don't think we were, we thought he would start or play. No. Oh, yeah. Well, the, the Cleveland Browns also did draft, they draft James Hudson a couple years back. So they, they kind of right. did that with some projects on the offensive line and it, yeah. and it's a tried and true method. I mean, like 
uh, the Eagles with Jordan Mailata. Like they're, they're the payoff when you have the athlete like that. Those are the guys you want to take a chance on in the mid rounds mm-hmm. if they're still there because – you know, if any mid round tackles, because such a position where pretty much all the high end tackles you can think of were first rounders, it's just yeah. people identify the talent very easily. But the ones you don't have good reason why, you know, the Jason Peters of the world, the Jordan Mailatas were high end athletes that for some way, shape, or form were not developed at OT yet. And then once they got, they were the payoff that was massive. So he's a guy that fits kind of that mold. I completely had forgotten about Jason Peters. And I was looking to like, I forgot what I was, I was just, I think I was just like looking up how many games he had actually played when he was randomly on the Seahawks. First I was like, like I, I, I just couldn't understand someone that age wanting to play on the NFL. <laughs> and I'm like, and he's made that much money. And I remember like, I was like, Oh my God, I forgot about how low he was drafted. Yeah. Crazy. Um, okay. Uh, let's take a quick break, come back, and talk about a bunch of defensive players, starting with a few who will go probably quite a bit higher. Why should you bet with Caesars Sportsbook? Two words, Caesars Rewards. Every bet brings you closer to the types of benefits only Caesars can offer. Hotel stays, VIP experiences, sports and concert tickets, and more. It's not just a nap, it's an empire. Okay, so the first guy that you sent me on defense is a player that I've watched a lot. Um, player who has been linked with the Seattle Seahawks a little bit. We'll see. That's certainly a direction that they could go in at pick 16. And that is uh, Byron Murphy out of Texas. Um, when you sent it to me, it was funny because I just thought, oh, hey, you sent me Kalaj Kansi last year. This year, you sent me Byron Murphy. Not to say that they're the same. There's some pretty significant differences. But I think that they share, as it pertains to the combine, some of the same questions. Yes, which is they're short. And he's <laughs> listed at 6'1". Sure. Yeah. May come in, but it doesn't take long to notice on tape that he's just like squatty. And so, but he, the thing is, unlike Cansey, who was short, but also kind of slight for a DT, yeah. he's 308 pounds. This guy is a thickly built, he's reminiscent of body type wise, at least. Grady Jarrett is probably like a better comp yeah. than a lot of the other undersized DTs because you're not really moving this guy. You're not getting underneath them with how lower center of gravity is and just how big he is at that size. And so he's interesting, unique in that regard. But then also, like Cansey, he's going to test off the charts. I think he said really? his goals are 4 8 second 40, a 7 2 3 cone, and 35 plus bench press reps, which is if you're saying that, you well, at least have to be in the ballpark, right? You're not saying, I want to do a 4 8 second 40 and you're going to show up and run a 5 1, right? <laughs> That's you're a clown if you do that. So he's going to be in the ballpark and off the tape, I, I think he is. And Truthfully, I don't think he makes it to 16. I'm like, no, really? I, I have missed it. I have as a top defensive player in this draft class. Yeah, I, but I to think whom? It, it, it's, the, the thing with the draft is there's so many offensive players that are going to go off the board early that if you are taking defense, you really have your pick of the litter. True. I guess Atlanta is will take a defensive if they weren't, if they don't go in quarterback direction. I think Chicago at nine. Oh, Chicago at nine. I could see happening. Yeah. Denver. After is that. I think New Orleans could just go best player available too as a team that could. But if he was there for Seattle, I, I would love that. I mean, they, they could um, definitely do so. Well, your point about his speed, I think it just jumps out when you watch the tape. He sort of teleports into the backfield. Um, he just he's so quick. Uh, his get off is just so impressive for his size, um, and he's. I, I really love watching him. Um, He's another fun, big little combo with uh, Tavondre Sweat, who we're not talking about, but who I'm excited to see just walking around. I might try to take his photo with me if I see him because he's so large. Uh, but uh, I like Murphy more as a prospect. Um, he, I, 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 the difference with Cansey, it's funny because, yeah, like, they're both short, but Cansey, I think, was a little bit more polished as a pass rusher. Although I will say, I, I do like Murphy as a pass rusher too. Super active hands, already like a pretty decent arsenal of moves. Um, he's just more of your every down player than Cansey was. And like Cansey, I had pretty, I, I was really concerned about his size versus the run. I don't really have those same concerns about Murphy, although, um, yeah, I'll be curious to see, I don't know what, how big he looks just if I get eyes on him, he does that thing that, um, Aaron, I'm not comparing to Aaron Donald, but he does the Aaron Donald thing that I love where he rides, he'll like jump on guys like a human backpack and just drive them into the ground that the <laughs> short guys do. Um, and I actually, his size, it, this is actually similar to Donald and Cansey. 
you can see um, offensive line get frustrated by it because it's so like it, it creates leverage problems. I, I really like him as a prospect. I'm really, really high on him. Um, that's interesting that you have him the top defensive player in the draft, though, because I don't think that's something I've seen a lot when I've looked at big boards. Yeah, I just, I just watch his tape and the guy that I, I keep going back to that I'm not sure you can get to this high a high, but who I think he profiles very similarly to at the next level is Geno Atkins in terms of just uh, like Geno used to just pull rush because he was six foot tall and he ran like a four seven coming out of Georgia. And so when he got underneath you, he could just treat guys as a blocking sled because there's nothing you can do when, <laughs> when, when you're to yeah. a six foot defensive tackle, who's that explosive. And I think by the end of the year and his tape at Texas, like the last handful of games, he kind of just figured that out. He was just, he yeah. did not even really mess around too much with trying to make guys miss. He just said, I'm going right through you. And if he does, you know, put up those kind of numbers, he can do those to NFL offensive linemen too, I think. Hmm. Um, yeah, I guess if he does go crazy to the combine, that would be one to watch as a riser. All right, you sent me two pass rushers, both really interesting. One who I had watched, one who I had never watched. Um you probably guess the one that I had watched more, which is that, which is Chop Robinson. Uh, he's so I, I find I haven't talked about this at all. The pass rushers in this draft really interesting. No, to me, there's no obvious order. There's no obvious number one. I strongly feel that way. Although it seems like there's a little bit of a consensus about a top three, and I'm seeing. Um, it feels like right now at this moment, I'm seeing a lot of Turner versus Latu or Turner Latu versus as the top three. So, and we'll talk about them in detail. Uh, but Chop Robinson, you're kind of seeing in that next tier out of Penn state. So before we get to his game, why do you find him interesting at the combine? Yeah. So I don't even, I wouldn't even like well, how I've kind of been talking about it is there's those three at the top that you mentioned, but then Robinson is just like a wild card because his evaluation is just how good you think your defensive line coach is in terms of developing this guy, because oh. His traits in terms of his, not only his get off, which is, you know, truly elite, like truly like doesn't come around every year. Not quite Micah Parsons. Micah Parsons is obviously in his own class, but about as good as you'll see outside of Micah Parsons once he gets to the NFL. The guy just flies off the line of scrimmage and he's going to go to the combine and reportedly is running the four fours already at over 250 pounds. So he'll prove that in Indy. But then not only that, so he can get up field, but then he's also agile and can make offensive tackles miss entirely. Like he can dive inside yeah. if he catches an overset and he will see offensive linemen not even get their hands on him. And the worry is based off his tapes that that's kind of the only way he won. <laughs> you know, like if he really, if guys could match his speed or knew where he was going, he really didn't have a recourse. He kind of has shorter arms. Um, he doesn't necessarily play with power consistently yet, but it's such a traits driven position edge pass rushers. It's, it's such a, when you have what he has, it just gives you so much leeway in the number of ways you can win. So I, I mm -hmm. think if you have a good defensive line coach, you know, you trust that guy to get his hands in a good spot. The sky really is the limit with this guy. I, I think he could be the best edge from this class in three years in terms of just pass rushing ability, mm -hmm. but it's just, He's so raw at this point in, in how he uses them and really hasn't played a ton of football because he was banged up this past year, too. I think he has better bend than any pass rusher in this class. Um, the flexibility isn't you alluded to it a little bit. Just the dip he gets is crazy. Um my concern is like we have seen some of these guys in recent years come into the draft, rise in the first round with kind of similar profiles. And then they haven't they've been just been designated pass rushers. Um, the name and it's a guy that I've been high on, but I was thinking about Josh Uche watching him a little bit. I don't know if that's a name that is way off for you, but and I like Josh Uche. But that's, I'm kind of, you know, like where I'm like, okay, is this a guy who can be a top 10 pass rusher in the NFL or is he going to be like an Uche style DPR who in the right system maybe racks up sacks, but never really becomes that like complete all around player? Yeah, I think you're definitely looking at a guy that, 
you you need a specific role for in terms of either you're running wide nines or he's a three four outside linebacker. You're not asking him to be versatile, go head up over tight ends, that sort of thing. But I think there's like you know there's kind of a spectrum of those type of rushers where maybe Uche is on one side and then like maybe like a Hassan Reddick is your better yeah. case scenario in terms of you know Reddick I think ran a four five one coming mm-hmm. out of Temple and when the Cardinals weren't messing with him at off ball linebacker when he was actually rushing the passer and obviously you see it in Philadelphia you know, he became one of the better pass rushers in the NFL. So there's, there's, again, there's a lot of outcomes with him when you're that unpolished, but I do just think the high end for him is, is worth taking someone yeah. in the first round. Well, because of how quick his first step is to like, he doesn't have to have a super complete set of moves. That was something that kind of jumped out to me watching. Like he would, it would, he would sort of like half, like a rip or something, but but he was he had already won in yeah. in a way, so it was kind of like all right, and he suddenly he's you know pressuring the quarterback, um, and that certainly gives him an advantage. Um, yeah, it's really situation dependent. Obviously, you want him standing up. Um, the other thing, you know, I, I mean, he plays really hard. That 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 I also like too. You know, his, his motor runs really hot. Um, sometimes a little too hot, I think, against the run, but uh, yeah, no, but and his name is Chop. Come on, uh, I actually don't even don't know his first name. He, he uh, doesn't really go to a Chop move, though, unfortunately, which know, is a real missed opportunity. I know, uh, you would think. Um, okay, Austin Booker, fascinating player. So he was the one I hadn't really watched. Kansas, uh, I saw him listed at 6'6, he looks bigger to me. Um, he he actually kind of looks like Johnny Wilson. Like his his build is nuts. Uh, so I guess combine wise, I mean, like, is he just gonna like blow the broad jump out of the water? Like, what are we thinking here? Yeah, I, I watched this guy move on tape, and to me, it's much more prototypical than even like Chop Robinson in terms of Robinson's kind of undersized, shorter arms. Booker is just how you would kind of build a modern edge rusher in terms of you know, 6'6", 240, over 34-inch arms. And then he kind of runs around like a wide receiver off the edge. Like he's just so fluid in how he moves. The the name I keep going back to that he reminds me of as a prospect is Max Crosby coming out of Eastern Michigan Mm. where the movement skills are there, the kind of – he tries a bunch of moves, but he's not really refined. And and Crosby was a young guy coming out too. Booker's only a third-year guy. Crosby was a third year guy coming out. So you could kind of excuse the fact that he wasn't really polished, but they just needed to get stronger. Crosby just, you know, Mike Mayak told that him to that on draft day. You need to get stronger. Austin Booker, he's 240 pounds. He came into the senior bowl. He just has to get stronger. But once he does, I really think his ceiling is as high as any of these other edge rushers in this class because he has good reason to not have you know, highly productive tape. He's only played 505 snaps in his career. I, I don't know who was advising him to come out early. Mm. But he's a guy that, you know, if he came back, had, you know, kind of like Tyree Wilson did, stayed later on in college, but then actually started producing, you would have seen him kind of go in the, you could have gone in the range that Tyree Wilson did last year coming out of Texas Tech. So huh. I, I really think everything's there with him. And I think you'll see that in his testing at the combine, except for play strength, which is the one thing that, you know, over the years, if a guy wants to, he can fix when you have that kind of frame that he has. Yeah, and when you talk about Crosby, thinking about everything Crosby has done to become an elite run defender, um, some of it is play strength, some of it is just re- recognition. Um, I love hearing him talk about that because he's put so much effort into the, the, the craft of stopping the run, and that's definitely going to be a big question mark with this player. Um, I, I uh, was like, what does this guy remind me of? I didn't Crosby didn't come to mind. I couldn't think of a player. And then I, I, I realized like watching him – especially um, when he turns a corner. To me, it looks like Giannis from the top of the arc when he takes like three <laughs> steps to get to yeah. there. That is what he reminds me. I wrote, he has a gait like a horse. Um, it's crazy. And it's interesting because uh, in contrast to the player we just talked about, I actually, uh, I don't know if you noticed this as well. I, I thought he actually um, didn't quite have his timing right. Uh, his get off was actually a little bit delayed at times. Uh, but it didn't matter because his recover because he takes one step for every human two steps <laughs> or whatever. Like he he just covers so much ground so quickly because of his body. So if he can improve that, 
Um, and then, as you said, develop some moves. It's another one where, yeah, like the just the physical archetype is so crazy, as well as the flexibility. He's not stiff, too, at his size, mm -hmm. which is, I think, also something that's kind of unusual. Yeah, I think the difference between Booker and Robinson and why I say like Booker probably has a little higher ceiling if he figures it out is that Booker is at like attempting a bunch of moves. He, he has kind of the coordination in him to do a lot of different things. I, I don't really see that with Robinson where it's just if he could, you know, get the reps to get those polished because when they hit, they are deadly. And the get off with him, like you said, just his ability to cover ground is kind of absurd with how he can fly down the line of scrimmage and that too in the running game. So yeah, I, I do think he ends up going higher than a lot of people are saying right wow. now. I, I think he ends up in the second round just because of wow. how big the payoff yeah. is and like everyone needing pass rushers. But he's also a guy who, if he would have played better in college, if he just played more in college, probably yeah. would have been already uh, getting talked about in that range. All right. Uh, I'm so glad you included a linebacker because there's so many teams that need linebackers. There's so few linebackers right now. Um, I'm sort of fascinated by the position and how hard it is to play at the moment and how hard it is to develop. Uh, and, and God, I mean, who's hit over the last five <laughs> years? Seriously. Whew. In the first round, I mean, not a lot of guys. Right? The track record's pretty weak. You got Patrick Queen finally kind of coming on. It seems like they always sort of come on, but it's year four that it kind of happens with these guys. No, no one ends up coming in. All you got to do is find the best linebacker in the NFL and put him next to him, and then you can develop yeah. your young linebackers. So. Yeah, I mean, Roquan's probably the last real hit, yeah. right? Roquan's yeah. was probably the last first rounder where you're like, okay, he was for sure worth that selection. Everyone else... Probably was not. We have a, it's not a, a, you know that meme with the goofy, the two dragons and the goofy dragons? Like there are, there's. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> so sorry. It's the serious dragon, a scary dragon and the goofy dragon. We do that with the lions always with Jack Campbell because <laughs> everyone's always like, Brad, uh, you know, cut crush the draft this year. We're talking about Jameer Gibbs. We're talking about Laporta. We're talking about Jack Campbell. <laughs> mm. <laughs> He's really fine. I just, he wasn't a first rounder also. So, um, wait, he was. He was. He was. pick 18. Yeah. 18. Yeah. It was pretty high. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's hard. It's hard. I, I say that not it is it is a little mean, but um, it's hard, very hard to play this position. So Peyton Wilson uh, at an NC State. Um, uh, where are people before we get into kind of what you like about him, the combine? Where is he being mocked to? Like, how high do you think he's going? I, I think like late third to even maybe day three. And, and that's because okay. he's torn his ACL twice and he's dislocated both his shoulders. And so has like only really had a couple healthy seasons throughout his career. And when he's drafted, he'll be 24 years old. So a lot of kind of knocks against him in those regards. But I almost think that the 24 year old thing, kind of what we're going back to about all these young linebackers struggling, it's because a lot of these guys haven't played a ton of football when they get to the NFL and they're just under siege against these NFL offenses nowadays. So you almost want those. It's like Love the, the Joe the Burrows, state. the Justin Herberts. It's like the quarterback equivalent of defenses. You like want them to have 3,000 yeah. snaps under their belt. <laughs> you want them to have seen it all before they get to the league so you can maximize that rookie contract. So I don't think that's necessarily a knock on him, the age. The injuries is for sure worrisome, especially with you know how much time he's missed over his career. But on tape, he's the best linebacker in this class and also a really high-end athlete and also has really good size at 6'4", 239. So – um, I, I think he's like the one do it all linebacker who can really rush the passer, cover deep, cover underneath, uh, play the run, get off of blocks, those sort of things. So I watch his tape and I think he's the best linebacker in this class. And, you know, he's not going to get drafted in the first round. None of these linebackers are, but after that, there's really, it's a sparse linebacker class. I, I, I think that if he really blows it up and gets clean medical checks, I, I'd probably end up taking him. I'd be willing to take him in the second round somewhere. Old linebackers being uh, arbitrage. It's the money ball edge. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Um, I first noticed him while watching Drake May. Uh, the uh, pick that game. Yeah, hit a pick. Uh, he had a, a little bit of ball. Uh, more than that, um, he chased down May, and it was a very impressive moment. Um, 
so and then after you recommended or you mentioned him, I watched a couple more games. Uh, I really like him. He is rarely out of position. He does have impressive athleticism, um, sideline, sideline speed. Um, he looks skinny to me on tape, yeah. but uh, <laughs> some of that is uh, the uh, the way he dresses, which I feel like <laughs> doesn't help. The high pants. Uh, yeah. Uh, but he has really good eyes, and that's what I really like. You know, I, I think – I, I, I have no idea now how to evaluate the position because of what we're talking <laughs> about. No, I'm serious. Like, I, I think, I you know, in recent years, I've been like, this guy's really athletic. But it just, I, I'm like, what matters? Like, what are we looking for here? Because Rokon was such a special and he was so obviously a great prospect and he had played at the highest level and he could do everything, right? Mm-hmm. And um, when you think about some of the guys taking the first round in recent years, um, it's a mixed bag of guys who were – smart guys who were good and they're against the run guys who were athletic guys who had ball production but nothing seems to be translating so uh, you know i I get like you can do worse than sideline sideline speed and good eyes in zone coverage you know so i I get like it seems like a a reasonable thing to take take a take a flyer on or at least um I w- actually, flyer is probably the wrong word because this is probably a player who can start pretty quickly um, based on the tape. Although, and you know, based on the fact that he's about to be in the AARP, so. Why not? <laughs> but the one guy who I go back to in the first round that I just can't like I just, Devin Lloyd, for the Jags. I was like, he has to be good, like early, he right? Was, and two years yes. in, and he's kind of just mad. So I think when like when that's the case, from all we've seen, the lesson is just don't take him in the first round. Just don't use the premium draft cap. I don't care how mm. good they look. Don't use premium draft capital. But then after that, I, I do think that you may not even – I don't want to say you may not even want to take them in the second, but it's also a position that I think free agents are getting more and more attractive at. That yes. I, I'd rather just go pay you no know, true tranquil, whatever, $5 million a year or whatever it is that he's making instead of trying to invest high draft capital in some of these guys because – the the timeline is yes. just so stretched out for these for these guys. Right. To make you want an impact. Patrick Queen now rather than yeah. as a rookie. Yeah. No, isn't that interesting though? It's kind of like the the reverse linebacker. Like I feel like sometimes um, when we people talk about the NFL and the cap and players and whatever, you know, get a uh, have a, we have a reputation for just saying go younger, draft, draft, draft. Don't pay them. But I I agree with you. It feels like the reverse might be true at this particular position because of the complexity of it and because it does seem very hard to play well early, um, which is really interesting. Uh, yeah, I, I and, and and there's some decent free agents. I mentioned Patrick Queen. I think Jordan Brooks out of Seattle is, is, is a good player. Another player who, by the way, similar, again, I thought played much better as his career progressed and he had battled some injuries. But by the end, the last two years in Seattle, you saw him avoiding some of the mistakes he made, particularly in coverage earlier on in his career. He was a first round draft pick as well. You remember? So very fascinating position. Um, yeah, a lot to, I, I think there's a longer off season discussion to be had about that. Um, but we have two more players to address one of whom, um, Looks like he might not be doing anything at the Combine, but I don't care. I want to talk about him anyways uh, because I'm kind of obsessed with him now. Coop. Does he go by Coop? Probably. Cooper Jean. I love him. He's so good. (laughs) He's so good. Anyone who watches him has to think he's good, right? Have you encountered anyone who puts on his tape and doesn't walk away wildly impressed? No. I mean, he's just – he's a football – like, he's a football player, right? He's just – the guy does it's like whatever you want, and he's played like slot and outside corner in his career. He's just good. And I went back and I watched, I looked into like his high school career, watched some of his high school basketball highlights because I'm always a sucker for guys who are high school like basketball stars because I think like cross sport athletes that at certain positions that's really helpful. And my gosh, he had a beautiful stroke. Can he you? had more points in high school than Harrison <laughs> Barnes did uh, oh, no. in Iowa State history. <laughs> He also had the sixth best long jump in Iowa State history. Like Incredible. this guy was a multi-talented guy who that's what I see on defense too. I, I truly think that any position on the back seven, whether it's even linebacker, slot, safety, corner, if you want him to play that or if he wanted to play that, he could because you're six one two oh seven now. But 
he's got a pretty big frame. He's got all around high end athleticism. He's explosive. He's agile. He's fast. And there's just really not a ton to dislike other than that. He was backing off into like cover three, every single snap, just running away from wide receivers in that stupid Iowa, Iowa. defense. Yeah, right, yeah. So that's really the only kind of question mark is, can you play press man? Literally the only is he an outside corner. Yeah. I'm looking Maybe. at my notes. I'm just like, I don't know. Probably he has the, mo- I think yeah. he moves well enough. Yeah, it did everything else. And he returned punts at a really high level, too. So He's really yeah. good as a returner. I mean, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I, I don't know. I haven't looked at the latest first-round mocks to see where he's stacking up along with um, like Wiggins and Arnold, I guess, are probably the top two corners. Um, Terry and Arnold out of Alabama, Nate Wiggins out of Clemson. But I – and, and then Toledo, uh, who I have not watched, but yeah. people love him, so I'm excited to watch him. Um, but my God, uh, I think this kid is such a good prospect. Um, I you know, one thing I I like about so he hasn't played a lot of man coverage again Iowa, um, but one thing I think that bodes well for that and sort of goes to his athleticism. He has like a really good sense of his own athletic abilities, if that makes sense. Like, um, he's really good at, you know, in zone, obviously he's got amazing eyes and he times, um, things really quickly. His route recognition is fantastic, but he's so good at closing and, and coming out of his backpedal. But whenever he, uh, is in a trailing position, he's not grabby. He doesn't get nervous. Um, he plays the ball like a receiver. And I just feel like, he will be able to do it all at the next level. I don't know. I, I, I just didn't see, there was not anything on tape that made me nervous other than the lack of seeing it. Yeah. That's how I feel. And also just like the versatility is wild watching you um, in yeah. terms of like he can tackle, he can play zone yeah. and the high end athlete though also, which makes you think, you know, that's kind of usually what it takes to play man. So unfortunately he's kind of the guy that if he would have gone to a different school, right. If he's go, if he went to mm-hmm. Alabama instead of Iowa, you know, he could be talking, talked about in a much different light right now. But unfortunately, just a lot of the question marks are because you didn't and we didn't get to see what, you know, you usually need to see for an NFL corner. So uh, is he not working out because of his injury or what's the because he did get hurt? So I, haven't is that, heard. I haven't heard Megan exactly is, what. So. Is, yeah, he yeah. suffered an injury at the end of his college career. I don't think it was particularly serious, right? Uh, I can't recall it off the top of my head. But it was like not, I mean, he didn't play, yeah, but you know, was minor, obviously. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, he's going to be one that I'm very interested in seeing as, cause you watch this stuff all year. So you are like very, I mean, you're very on top of all prospects all season long. And this is the kind of year whenever prime year, when people like me catch up, I just don't understand how people will catch up to him and not arrive at this conclusion like that I, I just i don't know I, no, I agree with you yeah i know what you're saying um okay the final player is i don't know man <laughs> i don't know uh vaki how do you say his first name sione i believe sione um he is a two-way player he played safety and running back um so i i mean i, I for Utah, I guess out of necessity, he had 42 carries for 317 yards, 11 catches for 203 yards, five uh, touchdowns total. Um, I thought he was good against uh, UW, so I remember sort of vaguely having a positive impression of him from that. But what, I guess my question to you is like, why? What, what's the what's the fascination here, <laughs> other than that he plays both ways? There's just a lot of absurd things about this guy, and that okay. not only did he play both ways, like he was nasty on offense you know 7.5 yards per carry he broke 20 tackles on only 42 <laughs> attempts and he just kind of like they just gave him the ball and they're like okay just just go they weren't really concepts when he was in there it's just schemed up plays just because he's kind of a freak athletically i mean he had the fastest gps time of any safety at the senior bowl had to hit over 20 miles per hour during really? the season on those runs against cal against usc so it, it, i expect him to go probably in the four fours at least and Really? I don't know. The, the, the intriguing thing about him is 5'11", 211. So good size. Like that's really you know strong for a safety. He's only played two years of college football. Also, he, he's a he was a guy who had a two year Mormon mission prior to ever showing up at Utah. Mm-hmm. And so usually we're talking about guys you know 
at minimum three years of college football. He's only played for two seasons. And and then the last thing that's wild to me is after I kind of was tweeting about him, posted some clips because I was like, this guy's, you know, just kind of this crazy athlete. His high school coach, or I think is his high school coach, guy claimed to be his high school coach, DMs me and says that his best position is actually slot wide receiver. That he's not even a safety. He's not even a running back. His best position is slot wide receiver. And he took reps there at the senior bowl. So I, I don't I don't know where to take this guy. I don't know what to do with this guy. But he's kind of a hilarious athlete is, and just a football player. Is he Taysom Hill? Uh, <laughs> he's the is new, that too yeah. on the nose because of the mission and the age? But... <laughs> Maybe he's the he's the running back version of Taysom Hill. Taysom Hill tight end. He's the running back slash slot receiver version. Of Taysom. He actually, as a defender, this is an insane comp, but he the way he plays does remind me a little bit of Jamal Adams. Um, That's that would usage wise, that was like what I've actually I think I really? said that. Okay, Jamal Adams Jets is how I would use him. Yeah, because he's kind of like a whirling dervish, you know, like just chaos, um, which. But I was watching him. I was like, I don't know. I, I like I don't. <laughs> I don't know where I'd put him. I don't know. Like he's you know um, he's a chaos agent. Uh, in front, Jamal Adams introduces like the high end version of those exact same problems. By the way, um, yeah. right? Because you know he can't really cover. He certainly can't play the post. Um, but if you can get him near the line of scrimmage, bad things can happen. And can make plays. yeah. Yeah, uh, that and he he did some stuff versus UW that uh, to that end. Uh, this is that'll be an interesting one. I because there are that, that that's one thing I've noticed. I mean, I know we you and I talked about Cooper and how he can play different positions, but you know he can play them. He, he'll I think he should be a cornerback, but um, there aren't that many players in the draft, at least that I've come across, who are that like jack of all trades profile that we've seen in recent years and that can be good and bad. I think there's a lot of examples of teams that just never figure it out. And then there's Kyle Hamilton, you know, uh, where they, they figured it out. So he's, this is an interesting version of that. I don't know what's going to happen with him, but listen, if he ends up being great, you heard it here first. If he becomes the next great slot receiver slash returner (laughs) slash box safety, I don't know what he does. Then Vaki. Vaki. He's, He's at least, uh, minimum is dude's fun. It's a fun, it's fun tape to watch. I mean, no, I, I, I like it. All right. Let me at, wrap by asking you, um, for just like a favorite that you have in the draft this year, like not one of these comp, cause we've been talking about guys you want to see or are interesting to you at the combine, but a guy that you just love, like you, if you were a GM, you would pound the table for this player. Oh man. The one guy that I, I think I'm way higher on than everyone else. And I can't wait to hear <laughs> is, is Bo Nix, Bo Nix from Oregon. I, I think yeah. he's a franchise quarterback. It's I, I watch his, I watched a lot of his career progression one from freshman year to retro senior year, five years of starting. Yeah. And he, he got better every he single did, year. He, you know, well, he, yeah, I hope he did. <laughs> exactly. Like couldn't get worse than freshman oh, year, God. but also he got better. I mean like the profile yeah. somewhat reminiscent of the name I've, brought up a few times his name is Jalen Hurts and that yeah, in terms who of thought like, Jalen Hurts as a freshman was an NFL quarterback. It, it, you would have been laughed out of the building. That was Bo Nix too. But the personality, the perseverance, the, the lot of things that it takes to be a good NFL quarterback, he showed by the end of his career at Oklahoma, right? I think that's Bo Nix too at Oregon. And then I think he's even more physically gifted, at least as a passer in terms of like his arm and arm talent than mm. Jalen Hurts is. And this last year, like a lot of the knocks on him are – offense related and not necessarily i mean i know he's not the most accurate but his accuracy got a lot better i think he completed like 77 percent of his passes this year even though you know a lot of them were screens but his accuracy got a lot better over the course of his career and just he didn't make bad, bad mistakes this past season so i don't know i see a high-end processor i see a guy who day one can at mm-hmm. least handle nfl offense but um we'll see I, i'm kind of out in the limb there i'll say but he's the one guy that i watched his tape and i was like Man, I, I think this is a skill set that can succeed at the NFL level. So, do you have him outside the top three, though? Uh, I have him QB three. So, I have Woo! Williams, Mayhem, Daniels. So, QB three, Bo Nix. That's a spicy take. Um, 
Yeah, I, I, I don't, I, I haven't decided on my, I, 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 I have the top three, the top three, but I, I haven't mm-hmm. decided on the order for me of the next three. But it is, it is going to be fascinating because there are a lot of teams picking around the same spot that need quarterbacks, and I have not encountered much of a consensus on that group. And those three quarterbacks are going to throw at the combine. Uh, so I'll be curious to see the the top three because that's the top three or not. Uh, so it'll be a chance for Bo, JJ, Penix to really shine. And I, I think to your point, I, I, it's, there's a really an opportunity for Nick's in particular, I think, to show what he's capable of as the thrower because, as you alluded to, the Oregon offense asked different things of him than some of his other offenses. So anyways, uh, that's fun. Uh, okay, we'll keep an eye on that one. Uh, Mike, uh, are you going to the comment? I will tomorrow. I'll be there. Same. Hopefully I will see you there. Uh, You guys can check this out on YouTube. Uh, It will also be on ESPN2 if you prefer to watch on television on Thursday afternoon uh, at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, But until then, thanks so much.